so today I'm going to be talking about combatants and destiny and the user research we did um, on that uh, prior to launch. My name is Jennifer Ash. I'm from Bungie. I'm a user researcher. I've been at Bungie for about two and a half years now, and I was working on combatants for about a year and a half. Um, just a quick overview. So we worked on Destiny. Uh, Destiny is a first-person shooter we released in September. Um, it has, uh, and that's kind of the really brief uh, overview of that. <laughs> so here's, <laughs> that's super short. Um, but I'll go into a little bit more detail about the combatants because that's what we're here to talk about today. So there are four races of each combatant. And within each of those, so we have the Fallen, the Hive, the Vex, and the Cabal, and each of them kind of have their own feel. Within the combatant races, we have four of those, there's combatant types, and that's what I'm going to be referring to those. Those are the individual combatants within the races. So that's like the shanks are these little uh, flying guys and um, all the other combatants. So I'm going to break them out by type and by race um, to explain those. We also had majors and uh, ultras within the, the combatant types, and those are more of the boss characters that you encounter. So that's another term that I'm going to be using today. So we shipped 20 missions, uh, six strikes, and four patrols, and that the combatants were used across all of those. So it was an issue of comparing against all of them. So I'm going to go over really quick some early focus areas we used to test combatants. Um, one of the things we used was concept art. And so in order to test the concept art, um, we used word associations. We would give players a survey with a list, and they would look at an image and give us uh, from those lists pick three, and we would be able to kind of get an idea about what people were perceiving combatants as. And that would see if it fit within what the character um, designers wanted and what the combatant designers wanted. We also looked at impressions of danger to see if they were coming across, if all the types were coming across to the right level of danger early on just based on art without behaviors. And we also wanted to make sure that each of the combatants kind of fit within their race and didn't feel like they may have um, split between different ones. We didn't want a hive to be mistaken with a vex, for example. So that was something that we um, asked questions about early on. The other thing we looked at was enemy visibility. So we would have them within the destinations. You want combatants to make sense for their their location, but you don't want them to be completely blended in. So it's it makes sense that the vex are kind of an orangey color and they're on Mars, but you don't want them to be invisible to the player, otherwise they're, it's going to get frustrating. So how we tested this, one way we did was we used timed images. So in our survey um, software, we could have an image stay up for five seconds and we would tell the user, you're going to see this for five seconds and then it's going to disappear. How many combatants were in that image that you saw? And if the number was completely off, we knew we had to look at how the combatants were within their environment, because obviously they were missing some key combatants. And we'd use different combinations to see which ones were probably the issue. The other thing we checked was combatant faction association. Each uh, combatant has different factions. We wanted to make sure that those factions were coming, that the combatants still felt like the same race, even though they might have been colored in some other manner um, on a different destination. Another area is enemy readability. So we wanted to make sure that the weapons that each combatant had fit their character and also fit how they were coming across in terms of the danger that the combatants uh, were perceiving. So if you saw a combatant, you would know which one to pick off in a fight first and which one you would want to pick off last just as a strategy information and also to inform design how they might want to um, put their squads together. And also how weapons read for range. So that way players wouldn't get s surprised if a weapon killed them from afar. If it looks like a short range weapon, we didn't want that to come across wrong. So we um, looked at how they perceived the weapon when held by a combatant. And we had images and had them explore that. We also looked at how players were strategizing against each of the combatants and how they understood um, what the combatants looked like and maybe what their like weak spots were. Each of our combatants had different weak spots. Um, normally, a lot of times in an uh, FPS, you've got the headshot. But we had the vex, which was in their stomach. So we had to make sure that players could understand that maybe there are certain types where combatants may have a different weak spot to aim for and uh, get those crit shots. Also, for abilities, we wanted to make sure that players could kind of expect for strategy what they were doing. So like, the Cabal can jump. They're huge guys, really? So we wanted to make sure that that was coming across to the players, that um, what sort of things they could expect from combatants. And it wasn't after they played with it, they knew they could expect that from them. Now I'm going to look at some of the data that we used to um, analyze combatants. So subjective data was one of the uh, types. Subjective and objective were really the two that you broke it down between. So subjective data is basically survey data, understanding the player perception. It also allowed us to uh, 
bridge disciplines. So a lot of questions could apply to both world design, character design, environment design, and we could get a better idea about where we wanted to dive deeper in for the data to figure out why those questions were coming across the way they were. There were generally three focus areas that could be broken down between. You had the general combatant behaviors, the combatant type questions, and then the boss encounter questions. And we're gonna go into each of those now. For general combatant questions, there were some that we wanted just to cover overall. I've got it broken down into about three different stages of game, the game dev cycle, which is kind of early, mid, and late of when these questions were probably most applicable and when they were uh, most useful. So one of the questions for more of the mid-range was, um, how often were you killed by an enemy you ever saw? That was kind of a follow-up question in regards to the early testing that we did about combatant visibility. Because if we had missed one or something had changed, we wanted to be able to confirm that that still wasn't an issue. So we um, asked this question, if it ever came up that they were killed by a certain combatant type, then we would go back and evaluate that again. We also looked at how quickly enemies respond. This allowed us to understand potentially um, if there were any balancing issues that World Design wanted to approach or uh, within their squad design. Um, another question of how, did how many enemies did you have to fight and encounter also inform world design that maybe their encounter space was too difficult and that would uh, affect the overall mission feedback. Grenades were something that were of, uh, kind of a unique question. Um, that came in about mid and mid late just to make sure everything was okay. Uh, powerful grenades, dregs have grades, grenades and they lob them towards you and sometimes participants were having difficulty seeing that lob. So we made sure to include it in the different uh, studies to see how, if they weren't seeing it or if they were being too powerful and being killed by them. So we kind of broke it out into those two questions. And that informed both the sandbox design and the AI and UI design because it's something that the player needs to understand and be communicated with. For each combatant type, we also evaluated for longer studies about what they perceived of the combatants. So this would be like the individual combatants within the race, so like the shank, the drag, the vandal, um, all the very specific ones. Um, one of the things that we looked at early on was continuing on from the concept art was how dangerous or deadly you thought these were. So that came down to player strategy. And then we would also follow up then with um, what strategy did you use against those combatants to see if they were approaching the squads from the correct angle. Um, we also used um, how much did you like fighting these combatants. And that was a good indication between difficulty and like fighting about um, how the players were perceiving the uh, battles. If there was ever a point, especially later on, this became important, was if they were still reporting that they really disliked a combatant, we asked them to follow up with text so that we could dive into more of their understanding than just making assumptions or looking at videos. Um, within the threatening, that came in a little bit later because the combatant designers had an idea about what they thought the threat would be like, but they wanted to make sure that players still understood that too. So that was a specific request to how the enemy was coming across visually, but also how AI design was affecting that. And then um, the other thing was, is there anything weird? So that was kind of our way to catch anything that might have changed within a, between different builds of our game or play tests to make sure that something wasn't somehow getting across as coming across wrong. For each, just like for the combatant types, we also did it for boss encounters. So um, early on we asked, how much did you like the boss? We also asked how satisfying was the boss? This was something that was really useful to understand because bosses tend to happen at the end of the mission. We wanted to make sure this was a satisfying experience. Satisfying was more actionable than like for a lot of options, so we uh, ended up sticking with satisfying in the end. And also recording difficulty to compare if how difficulty and satisfaction uh, went hand in hand together. And that informed AI design and world design a lot. Um, we also used the strategy question based upon early feedback and also if a boss was particularly getting some information that seemed confusing, we wanted to find out more so we would just ask them to fill out a text answer. But in general, we were trying to keep to quantitative methods that we could, we wouldn't have to parse through the data afterwards, we could quickly look at some results and see how they compared to other studies. Um, length of the battle was more important early and mid to kind of balance out mission design. And also, uh, memorable moments was one that kind of surprised me about how useful it became to evaluating combatants. So during each mission, we, afterwards we would have them fill out a survey and one of the questions was how memorable was the moment and oftentimes that's where we would find out if the boss was hitting its uh, goal or not because most of the time that's what players would put and we could see what their impression of that boss was. Um, also taking cover from the boss really informed AI design according to the behavior of the enemy. Um, 
if there was anything um, within the space that uh, wasn't threatening enough, that would come up in that question of how often did you need to uh, take cover. Normally players you know, shouldn't want to just feel like they can just run in and melee them. You should want to hope that there's some strategy for certain combatant types. So how we tracked all this is throughout the different studies, um, basically about a year of studies I tracked in an Excel sheet. <laughs> and this made it really easy to go back and compare averages and also made it uh, quick to go back and compare how the different shifts and trends happened because each study had similar questions. It was really quick to evaluate the differences between the two. Uh, one example is this, um, so this graph right here. So we have like and dislike, and you could see really quickly this is comparing two studies of if there were significant changes between the two. And because we had the data from previous studies, we could really quickly run an analysis to see if there was a significant change particular. But it's also a really quick visual way to kind of check all of that. So a case study of one of um, how we used uh, the subjective data. So in one level, we had, um, or one mission rather, we had ratings that were continually low for the major and the boss. And also the mid-major, for some reason, was getting higher scores than the end boss, which is not the, the normal case. So what could be done to change this impression? The world designer actually came to me and noticed there was a trend amongst the majors of that most of the majors were getting lower scores than the ultras, but also this particular combination wasn't working out for some reason. So we went to discover why was that. Um, we talked to AI design. They noticed that the combatants were being used in a space that wasn't optimally designed for that combatant type. But if, um, if they switched them, it would, be an optimal it would be a more optimal situation. This was late in development, so it was kind of a stressful point to do this at. However, we were like, well, we can put it in the lab and see if it compares better. At least at that point, there's time to edit and change. So what we did was um, we threw it in the lab and saw what happened. And luckily, it came out that when the majors were swapped, it was a much better fit for the mission. And the scores uh, pretty much inverted themselves, which was fantastic. So um, it was a great way to kind of show how indicative data could help with changing some mission and level design. The other thing we uh, recorded over time was difficulty. So here's two examples of some graphs for comparison. The, the top graph here has the easy and difficult. So you can kind of see overall, you can see a trend amongst the different combatant types and how they're being perceived. And then uh, compared against two studies is the bottom graph here. So you can see if there's a major shift between two different studies, you kind of have to question yourself of what happened here. And uh, is that the, the right direction you wanted things to go? An example of how we used that was the knight knockback. So in one of the studies, all of a sudden, the difficulty scores for the knight just rose incredibly. Like um, It was really easy to point out. And world design hadn't changed anything. We went to them, we were like, what changed? They said, nothing. We had changed nothing in our encounters. So what went wrong? What changed? What came back? Um, so how we approached this question was we looked at the data. We looked at the average deaths between the two different studies. We found out that. It was definitely higher in this current study. Um, and then we went back to look at the videos of the player deaths. So for each death, we record a location of where the player died, and then we can access that video to look at the instance of that death. What happened is that the knights, uh, major knights had, had their stagger uh, reduced, so their ping reduced. And this change had, instead of just affecting the majors, had been applied to all of the knights. So players would go up to these characters that they had played with before, and they'd go up to melee them, and instead of punching them in the knight staggering backwards for a second, would just pummel them. They would just die instantly to these knights. Um, it was kind of an amusing thing to watch, personally, because you never see this experience of this player having so much confidence walking up to the knight and then just being like taken down. Um, but this was a great thing that was kind of fun that we caught kind of a bug that wasn't necessarily uh, expected, and it was something that you know might have slipped by if we hadn't caught that. So objective data, we looked at data mining in SQL and Tableau. That's some of the examples of how we would record objective data. This would help us understand player behavior and also uh, any unexpected ripple effects design changes had. So some of the particularly useful data that we uh, maintained and used over time was the event type of a death and a kill event. Also the location of the character, but also the combatant, either if they were the target or the acting character. 
We also uh, had the different type of character types so that we could uh, understand which was at which location and then the damage type because some combatants had two different damage types and so this would allow us to pull out and see if there was a trend amongst either the combatant or the type of damage they were doing. Uh, we so for average player kills by destination, this would be a really good way. This was a really good way to inform world design and investment design. If there was any outliers and potentially could affect economy issues or the fund difficulty scores, this would be a quick way we could provide them a graph that they could look down really quick and see if one mission in the middle of the activities were different for some reason. We could also do a heat map because there were so many incidents to really quickly look at locations and see if there were potential problems. Um, an example we used for that is uh, the shank flank. So the, the shanks consistently had low like scores for a little while, and they were killing an unexpectedly high number of players. They're not meant to be the killer. Um, so what was happening there was the question. So we went back to doing the whole, uh, where, do, where are the deaths happening by the shanks, and look at the videos to see what was happening. What we discovered was the placement was being an issue for the shanks. So shanks would spawn behind the players and then they would remain behind their shoulders, right out of their view. The other thing is for their uh, damage notification, it was super low. Um, it wasn't uh, something that the players were meant to notice. It wasn't, they, they had a really small damage type. So what we discovered was that a lot, of combat a lot of players weren't seeing the shank and they were staying behind their shoulders and other combatants were doing most of the damage, but then the shank would get the killing uh, blow because they were actually had a higher rate of fire because of their low damage type. So these shanks would be standing behind them, shooting at them, the player would be dying and then they make the final blow and the player was like, why did I die? And it would be a point of frustration. So one thing that this led to was kind of a best practice of world design to change the spawn location and also AI design to change their behavior to never just hover behind someone's shoulder and to actually come around to visible point of view for the player. Another example of how we use this data was through the damage type. So all the light purple on this graph is actually melee damage and we were looking at how which combatant was doing this damage. In this case, it was the Thrall. The Thrall had low like and difficulty scores, but somehow they were doing most of the killing, which is weird. And so we were like, what's happening? So the action that we took to figure that out was determine the mission with the highest number of deaths to um, go into deeper, and then also, once again, viewed the videos to see what was happening. The discovery was a best practice with world design. Um, we found out that when well, AI design had not anticipated world design to add more than three to four thrall at a given time being thrown at the player, and, in, and whenever there was more, the player got overwhelmed. So there was a point where we made a best practice of not doing more than five or so. And the other thing was how they were being spawned. So if thrall were ever spawned from the side, players would easily get overwhelmed by them just coming at them from uh, the side angle. Whereas if the player saw them coming, they could easily take care of them. So we made sure that in future missions, all the thrall would always come from a point where the player was looking at a given time during a fight, so that way they could um, confidently beat the thrall. We also looked at uh, player deaths. This was a quick indication for world design to see if there was maybe a bad encounter or also maybe too many enemies in that given location. And also combatant distances. So because we had placement data, we could calculate the distance between the player and the, the combatant. This was a good audience for um, AI design, world design, environment art. How this applied to AI design was because um, players were only supposed to be noticed by combatants at a certain distance and also um, engage with players at a certain distance. So if they were being engaged with at a long, at like the green level, the green is the furthest, the longest distance, this was probably an indication of potential issue and what was causing that. Um, it also was potentially an environment issue because if a player could, you know, hide out, thought they were hidden from sight and they weren't, then something needed to be changed. So it was something for environment to look at too. And that leads into actually the reverse um, option of where the player's doing most of the kills from a long distance and the combatants are, are just being wiped out from afar. This affects the world design because um, the player can potentially just pick combatants off and it loses all sense of difficulty for the player to go through that mission. Um, and then also it maybe indicates cheesing spots. So that was a way that we could quickly kind of look through early on and see that. I'm getting two slides. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he said I have 10. <laughs> okay. Um, and also we have um, squad placement potentially was unintentional when there was a different player percentage. Um, 
So uh, this was something for the combatant designers that maybe they put it off in a place where a player didn't see them. And so if a player was being killed by them from a far distance, maybe that was something to readdress of where the squads were placed. So just really, uh, this is the last topic I want to kind of summarize with, was teamwork. So a lot of things I learned was how to deal with various teams and how to approach the teams. Because this combatants ended up covering a wide variety of uh, feedback, some of the best practices I learned was actually um, creating these uh, sh short, frequent chats. So a lot of times when you set up a meeting with someone, it's too formal, and that way you don't get the sense of communication. Whereas if you have a chat, you can just walk over to their desk, and they'll update you with what they've been doing, any concerns they have. It's also flexible enough that they could reschedule, which was a convenient way to just keep on their schedule. Because the more um, I lost track of what was happening, the more the changes would be more drastic. So it was a nice way to just kind of keep on top of things. Um, it was informal, it was flexible, um, and overall uh, 15 minutes a week was a decent uh, amount of time to check up with that. Also was customizing the reports. A lot of times the easiest way to get people to pay attention to the data is when it was really easy for them to parse the information that was pertinent to them. So part of that was color coding the comments. So each design, I would give a different color each design section. And then they could just quickly read through to see which part of the comments that the players had done applied to them. Or if they were curious how what their section applied to a different area design, like world to sandbox, they could just look through the colors that were important to them. Um, also created pages for each designer that I would report to with the highlighted data and the averages and a quick table so they could briefly look over that and compare to previous studies for their missions. Because in reports, often there's so much information there that a designer just feels overwhelmed. So if I gave them a summary page, they were more likely to go into the, the other pages, the deeper pages. Also direct linking to things, again, making it convenient for them to find the data. Um, for the AI designers in particular, it was important to look at more of the overall trends. They weren't really interested in permission. They were interested in how the combatants were doing throughout the entire game. So it was more averages and trends and also focusing on the comments more. So that's where like the memorable moment came in important, like dislike questions and the missions, and not just the questions that we provided at the end of the survey. And that's that. So if you have any questions, I'd love to hear them. Cool. <laughs> And I believe we also have an FAQ panel afterwards. So if you have any questions more overall, Nick and John will come up here soon. John's somewhere. Hi. All right. Uh, sure. Well, you mentioned Jordan. you had a best practice of only having five thralls at a time. Was that informed in the Crota's End Raid, where there's a horde of thralls? Was, was that part of that decision? So there's certain. There's certain best practices that were more mission-based than it was particular. It's kind of design-based, right? Um, that was more just overall general. That wasn't specific to a particular mission. Yeah. Question? Oh, thank you. Um, what was, sorry, uh, what was the general cadence or iteration of your, your testing? Like you, you had a lot of different topics that sort of came up, but were those yep. regular labs that were going on where like any question could filter in or? Yeah. Yep. Um, so the cadence was uh, dependent a lot at which part of the process we were in. So early on, it was less frequent than later on in the game. When we're, it's uh, dependent a lot on the builds that were available. And so early on, it was probably on a, a more monthly compared to weekly basis. But it was fairly regular cadence. Was it trigger points, or was it just like okay, beginning of month? Do you know what I mean? Like. Yeah. I mean, it depends. So if there were trigger points, um, the question. So um, there were points where we there were changes made that we definitely want to try and get it in the lab, and that triggered getting in there. Um, it kind of was just a situational thing of, was there a significant mission change, or was there a significant combatant change, and how do we want to approach that? Yep. So, um, oh, sorry. I'll loop this. three different classes. Um, was there any significant differences between the classes presentation or classes Could you repeat that again? Sorry. Um, so Destiny has different classes. Yeah. Were there any significant differences between those classes and their perception of uh, the various combatants? Um, I don't have any data on that that I could report definitively for you on that one. Sorry. Hello. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I specifically had a question about the melee. So. Um, 
I was one of the players that went around wanting to stab everyone, and I think the only difference between stabbing each character was the amount of time between stab one and stab two, which would finish them. Um, I was curious uh, as to how that, the, specifically, uh, the melee uh, doing damage to health is, or and guns doing damage to health, you, there's a lot of balancing that has to go on so that you make sure they don't give them enough health so that shooting them to death makes it difficult over stabbing them. So I was wondering how all of that w was figured out to make sure that the <coughs> wasn't just super easy compared to shooting them. So that kind of played between investment design and combatant design, I would say. So Nick may have more information on how that played out. No? All right. So um, I think <laughs> I think a lot of that was a balance of if we saw in a play test, like if combatants were mostly being, like we also recorded the damage type the player applied to the combatant. Um, that was probably more of a mid tuning, mid production tuning. Um, and if there was ever a point where melee became popular, the question became why? Um, and then we would approach that of like, what what is going on in this situation? It would be more of a case by case basis than it necessarily a, a to that granular of a level. The melee online, as far as the uh, the uh, the special that the rogue had, when so he would go into a special mode, and then every knife kill that he'd have, he had two extra seconds to kill a second person, and that turned into uh, very OP, is what everyone was calling it online, and it became a everyone was no one no one wanted to be the other uh, people, everyone was just having each other at that point. So I was wondering if um, I hadn't played in a while, I just wasn't sure if that was fixed. So I was curious as to how you figured that stuff out. Um, that would be a deeper dive question, I think, uh, not something that's kind of overall. Sorry. Yeah, that's fine. But that would be that would be a situation where um, actually, oh, yeah. so I have a slide that dives deeper, right? Like if we find out there's a question like that comes up, the actually I'll answer it. So class balance and investing is actually remarkably balanced. I mean, it's pretty close to one third, one third, one third. So yes, the blade dancer may be a little overpowered in some situations, but it's balanced out enough that they're not being played by everybody. Uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Did somebody else? Oh, we're out of time. Do you just want to pull up and we'll just start yeah. the next one? Cool. There's the next one. All right. Uh, we'll just continue from here. Yeah.